Testing, one, two, three, testing. Good morning. My name is Pastor Keith, and I want to welcome you to our online service here at Grace Baptist Church. Our, we've been doing a Bible study through the Word of God, and we're very thankful that you have come to join us this morning. Um, or maybe it might be evening, or whenever you come to join us, we're very thankful uh, for you uh, to come and uh, participate with us. And as we open up, I would like to take a, a moment to, uh, uh, to everything okay? <laughs> like it, okay to, I'd like to take a moment to let's uh, go to the Lord um, in prayer and exaltation and thinking about His His great name and and as we do that, I want to just pop over to uh, Psalm uh, one hundred and forty one and and uh, and this will be our our opening prayer. O oh Lord, I call upon you. You hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call you. May my prayer be counted as incense before you. The lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. O oh, set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice deeds of wickedness with men who do iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon my head, upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it, for still my prayer is against their wicked deeds. Their judges are thrown down by the sides of the rock. They hear my words, for they are pleasant. As when one plows and breaks open the earth, our bones have shattered at the mouth of Sheol. For my eyes are toward you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. I do not leave my, you do not leave me, uh, and do not leave me defenseless. Keep me from the jaws of the trap which they have set for me, and from the snares of those who do iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by safely. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you um, for that prayer, uh, Lord, from your uh, Psalm 141. Just a prayer just to remind us of of what's coming. If you uh, if you are local and you want to join us today at 11 o'clock, we will be having a Lord's Supper. We certainly want to welcome you to come and participate in that. One of the benefits, certainly, of being able to meet locally. Um, if you can't, we certainly understand and are thankful um, that we have this opportunity that we can do this and we can participate in this way. And, um, and like I said, we meet every Sunday at, at 11 and you're always welcome. And uh, now, let's take a prayer, a moment to pray for the coming of God's kingdom. My Lord, we have been going through this Bible study series about how you have taught about the kingdom of heaven through parables. Ancient mysteries that reveal the character of your thought, the natures of your, of your thinking, the natures of your heart. And we are getting this opportunity to get glimpses into that. Lord, and I, I do realize that maybe there are some, Father, who are listening and they might have questions, might even be skeptical. And Father, I'm very thankful that they've joined us and that they have those questions. Spirit of the living God, would you speak to me, through me, to, to me as well as to the rest of us. Speak to all of us, Lord, that we may gain a greater understanding of who you are, a greater understanding of the work that you're doing, that we may come to understand the ways that you think about your coming kingdom. And uh, Lord, we ask this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, you know, as we think about uh, the whole idea of the kingdom of God. If you've been following along in this series at all, and, and if you've been following along in the previous series that we did about the kingdom of God, 
What we begin to see and to understand about the ancient truths of God, what we begin to understand about His ways of thinking, um, is that it's quite different from what we think. We would want to say, oh, what we're thinking is more modern and, you know, we've come a long way in our teaching and our understanding. Uh, but uh, really the reality is, is that we've drifted away from his line of thinking. We've drifted away from his kind of understanding. And that is the nature of the human heart. You see, even back in the garden, right? When Adam and Eve, when God gave them everything and said, you can eat freely of the tree of life and live forever. Um, in their way of thinking, Satan came along and, and started teaching them that, you know, there's no value in the word of God. And so their teaching, start, I mean, their, their, their understanding began to shift. It became more modern, right? Because it was better for them to be the masters of their own destiny. It became better for them to be their own gods, so to speak, um, and to, uh, to, to live outside of, of God's truth. Um, and so that's kind of this, when we, or kind of this perspective or this understanding of, of when Jesus is coming, he's teaching these truths and he's teaching them in parables. He's, he's revealing ancient truths that have existed from all time. It's, it's, it's God's ways of thinking have not changed. God's uh, heart, his intentions, his desires, his plans have been the same since before the foundation of the world. Um, we've just become blinded to them. And, um, and so what Jesus comes and reveals these things, it, when, when we come across them, they seem like strange to us. And um, when we think about, so the kingdom of God, for example, we think about fairness, right? Like we all want to be treated fairly, right? That's safe to assume. I'm assuming that you're, you're watching this and maybe you live in America, maybe you live somewhere else. Uh, but you want to be treated fairly, right? You go to a job and you put in a good hard day's work. You want to be paid for that good day's hard work. And, uh, you know, if, you, uh, if you're there at a company for a long time and you put in the time and there's chances for promotion, you, you probably want to be considered for those kinds of things because it would just seem like it would be fair. Because why? Because you've invested in that time and... And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, and, and so a lot of times we end up like, uh, because the world is not fair, because things don't always happen the way that we would hope to, um, we end up realizing that sometimes things just don't turn out fair and it tends to lead us to a place of where uh, maybe of grumbling, maybe of complaining, maybe of, um, of, of, Resentment, even, um, uh, perhaps justifiably so in some cases, um, from a human perspective. Um, but when we're thinking in terms of the kingdom of God, things are quite, quite different. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk today, I've entitled this message, Fairness and the Kingdom of God, um, because the way we view things, the way we put things in perspective would be completely different. If, if I was the ruling king over the universe or over this earth, uh, I would certainly be running it from a completely different perspective than God. And uh, most certainly you would as well, right? Because um, we're very limited in our scope or our understanding of the big picture. We don't even have the ability to understand the big picture. And so what looks like fairness to us may not look like fairness in the kingdom of God, right? And so uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be looking uh, this morning at Matthew chapter 20 verses uh, 1 through 16. Um, so if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16 and this is the passage that we're going to use uh, to look at this morning, and this is the point that we're going to explore today, and that, and that is this, that the Father's gift of grace 
is both undeserved and equally gracious. In other words, it's equally gracious to everyone. Therefore, we need not grumble that it's not fair. Um, and so that's what we're going to be looking at. So uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, I will ask if you would stand uh, in honor of the reading of God's Word. I do like, I don't, for when we do the reading, I don't put the scriptures up there for that because I'm hoping that if um, you have a copy of God's Word that you're able to read along in it uh, for your own self. That way you're becoming familiar with the text. There are different, uh, of course, uh, many uh, different versions, many different good versions, some, some we want to be careful of. Um, some of you may be even following along in a different language, who knows. But uh, in any case, I want you to be able to follow along so that as we go through this Bible study, as we're reading through this, you're going to be able to continue to follow along. Uh, you're going to be able to uh, mark highlights and things like that in, in the Word of God. But listen, it's also appropriate sometimes to just hear the Word of God. If you don't have a copy of the Word of God, that's okay. If you just want to stand there, close your eyes, and meditate on the reading of God's Word, that's also good. It's all, uh, what, however the Spirit of God is leading you, however you best will process and honor that word. Um, so we stand to honor God's word, but remembering it's really a posture of the heart. We can stand and not be honoring God's word in our heart. So there's no judgment. I'm not going to judge you. It's all between you and God, right? So, um, so starting in verse 1 of chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for denarius for the day, he sent them out into the, his vineyard. And when he went out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, You who go into the vineyard, you go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one of them received a denarius. When those who hired fir came first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you gave them, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as I give you it is not lawful for me to do what I it is not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own is it not lawful or is your I envious because I am jealous generous so the last shall be first and the first shall be last Lord bless the reading of your word amen thank you you may be go ahead and be seated um, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, so again, here is the, uh, the passage Jesus is teaching um, to his disciples about the kingdom of heaven. And, of course, there would be those in the audience, those who are um, a majority of them obviously would be Jews. And so they would be hearing this. Some would be understanding. Remember the whole idea of, of a parable that Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God in these ways because it, it lays out these truths in a way that's not always abundantly evident for everybody who's listening to it. So it's, 
you know, hiding the truth out in the open. And um, so in this one, it says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a, a landowner. We've been going through and he's been talking about the kingdom of heaven in different, in different ways. So uh, what are you talking about a landover? So this is just a picture of um, the Jezreel Valley right there. So uh, it would be uh, the city of Nazareth which is obviously not even today a huge bustling city, but you notice into the valley all the, the massive amounts of land. And, um, you know, when, when you think about, uh, about that, uh, the people would have this, you know, owners would have that land and they would have, uh, they would want to, um, they would want to be able to, to benefit from that. So they would plant uh, crops and things like that. And, and, uh, and so uh, that's how they would benefit from that. Of course, they would reap from that. It would provide food for their families, uh, but it would also provide income. They could make a trading with other people for other things that they might need. Um, but uh, so in this case, when we think about this, he's, he's giving a common illustration that everybody would have understood in that day because this was the way that people lived. There were people who owned land and there were people uh, that, that needed uh, while the landowners needed work, um, the people also needed from the landowners. But, uh, but as Jesus is talking about this parable, who is the landowner? Who is he referring to? Well, the landowner in this case is God. He is the, and he's the main subject of, the, of this whole story. Jesus is talking about his father. That's exactly what he told his disciples when we read in John. That's one of the themes throughout John constantly. He says, I come to reveal the Father. And, um, and so specifically, he's revealing some of, the, some of the nature of who his Father is. And so that's what we're going to be looking at as we go through this. We're wanting to learn about the heart of God. And, and specifically, as we think in terms of, of fairness, right? So he goes on and he says, so the landowner, he went out early in the morning. So this would typically be about six o'clock in the morning uh, because he wanted to hire some laborers, right? So, um, so he's, he's out. The idea being if you, if you get out early and you find some laborers and they're going to start at six o'clock, that's bright and early in the morning and that's before the sun comes out. And so you get a lot of work done during those hours. You know, I've worked on crews before working on the out, out, outdoors, like cutting grass and like, what do we do, right? So sometimes we would start real early, start with some of the heaviest tasks, being out in the big fields and whatnot. And we would save the smaller jobs or the sometimes the inside jobs for the heat of the day, right? Because you don't want to. So there was a, you know, this idea here's this uh, landowner from the very beginning of the day. He wants to get started on the work of the vineyard right away. And, um, and so he goes out early in the, in the morning to hire workers, uh, and specifically hire two workers for his vineyard. Now, what is a vineyard? A vineyard is a place that is growing grapes, right? So you got vines and grapes growing on those, and um, and so that's the fruit that is going to be a result, right? So there's um, obviously a lot of work that needs to happen in a vineyard. Uh, uh, one of the things about vines is that they grow up and they attach themselves to things. And so, um, so having a vineyard will require a lot of work all throughout the season because as the plant grows, you want to you wanna strap the plants to the trellis, right? There's also pruning work that needs to be done uh, because if you uh, have a lot of loose branches with no fruit on them, you want to cut those off so they're not sucking all the nutrients and things out. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs... Uh, to be done in the vineyard. And so that's naturally, that's why uh, a, a guy would want to hire help because if, if it's a big field um, and a big vineyard, he would not be able to do it all himself, right? So, but in the story then, what we're talking about, what is the vineyard? What is Jesus referring to as the vineyard? The vineyard refers to the nation of Israel in particular that Jesus is referring to now. For us in our day, in our context, this and, 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 and even here, also the vineyard refers also to the world. Like it has always been God's intention that He wants to, um, to reach the world for Himself. And uh, so that's what the vineyard represents. So then we jump on to verse 2. It says, After agreeing 
with the workers on one denarius, he sent them uh, into his vineyard for uh, the day. So when we think in terms of one denarius, if you were with us when we were studying uh, previously about the value of a day's wages, um, that, that was typical. One denarii represented a normal day's pay. And so it probably was very easy to negotiate that, right? So if you were going with an employer, like many of you probably been, some, you might be watching and, and say, you know what, I've, when I got my job, I negotiated uh, my, my salary with my employer, right? So, uh, so there's that idea that you would, uh, if you're going to go work a job, uh, say at uh, Subway, for example, and maybe the boss is talking to you and they say, well, what kind of wage are you expecting you should make? And if you, uh, if you say, well, I'm thinking that I could make $15 an hour or maybe $18 an hour, that might be within a range of saying, well, okay, I'm going to look at your experience. I'm going to look at uh, your responsibilities and the things that you're going to do. Maybe, all right, maybe we can work out a wage. But if you came in and said, you know, I'd like to make, uh, you know, $57 an hour, uh, you're not going to be considered because it's not even normal. So it, this would be what was considered. But really what we want to ask ourselves is this question. In this story, what does the wage represent? Because remember, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And the owner is God. The vineyard is the nation of Israel and the world. But what does the wage represent? In other words, that is what God, the landowner, is going to pay the worker. Here's what it is. The pay is God's grace, or in other words, it's the gift of salvation for the undeserving. And so the workers recognize their need for God's grace. So let's, let's put this from this perspective, okay? You go out to get a job, right? You know that you need a job. Why? Because you are short something. You don't have the money to go out and buy food or to have the transportation you need to go take care of your mom or to go do whatever, right? So there's always these needs that are popping up. And so where do you go to, pr to provide that? You want to obviously want to try to work. And so you go to someone who has the ability to give you the employment. And, uh, and so in that sense of when we're talking about the kingdom of God and about coming into the kingdom of God, that the, there is the, there's a, a need that we recognize that there's a gap that exists between us and him. And, uh, and so and that we're not, even a, we're not even deserving of what he does give us. And there's that idea that he wants us to come in, in that way. So, so it goes and says that after agreeing with the one denarius, so what does that happen? It says he sent them into the vineyard for one day. We see the word there, he sent them. This idea that God, all throughout Scripture, has been taking laborers and sending them out into the vineyard, right? So, what is, so, so, the, so the question is that we're asking, what is the work of the laborers? And here's the work of the laborers. Sharing in Jesus' mission to, Israel, to the nation of Israel. That's exactly what God is talking about. It's exactly what Jesus is talking about in this uh, situation. And um, if we look all throughout the history of the nation of Israel, God has constantly, constantly been what? Reaching and taking people and reaching out with the message of the gospel or reaching out to his message with his heart, with his intentions all throughout uh, history. As a matter of fact, the author of Hebrews says it this way. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. So we have to understand that God was using the nation of Israel to be his spokespeople, to be his representatives. It was his intention that they would be his people, but that they would also be his representatives in the world and that through them he would bring the world to himself you see so God's vision has always been for the world not just for the nation of Israel he's always been uh, his heart's desire has always been to bring everyone to himself as a matter of fact when we look at uh, the Great Commission it says he's called us to uh, make make disciples what of all nations right if we look closely at that verse right Jesus says all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth 
What does that mean? That means he has all power. He's the king. This is his kingdom. This is, he has, uh, he, he's going to do everything that he said he's going to do. Why? Because he has the power to do it. And so he says, uh, he says, therefore, what? Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you, right? So this, is, this has always been God's heart. And now Jesus has entrusted that mission to the church, part of what we're doing here, part of why we're being here, sharing the Word of God with you uh, this morning. And, uh, and so that's what we find here, is that these workers have agreed on the labor, on what the pay is, and uh, and and they're out laboring, and um, but what do but but when we look at this, it teaches us something about the Father. When what do we learn about the Father? And it's this: is that He's compassionate and willing to give workers what they need, what they cannot achieve on their own. You see, that gives us a glimpse into the Father. He's not, and He's joyful about this. I mean, He's up early. He's not just because He's trying to make money off his vineyard. He really cares about people and he really wants to uh, help them out. So they're out there working, right, and laboring and doing the, the work of the kingdom. And then it says in verse 3, he says he went out about 9 in the morning. Okay, um, some versions would say uh, that he went out about, um, uh, what was it, the uh, the third hour? Or the... the um, yeah, the, the third hour. So he says in the morning he saw others standing in the marketplace. Now, what is the marketplace? So here's a place that people would go and they would stand there and they would wait. And if you were a landowner or you had some kind of construction project or whatever, you could go to that place and you could find people who were willing to work for that day. Now, in ancient Jewish and in Jewish culture, it was it was proper at, at that time that at the that because a denarius represented one day's wages, that was roughly about the expenses of a day. Um, so people needed they didn't have banks, all that stuff. So they get paid at the end of the day. So you would show up for the marketplace. The la the the workers would come. The the people who were in charge of vineyards projects they would come and they would look for workers to bring them uh, and and to to their help them work. Uh, on whatever project they've got going. And so here it says that he went to this marketplace and he saw people who were standing there. And again, we're going to get a glimpse into the heart of the Father because look what he says. So um, again, again, okay, so what is the marketplace? The marketplace representing for us, representing the people, more people who are in need, right? These are more people who have who who have it? They they have to be, get some work because they need their provisions. He said to them, "You also go to my vineyard, right?" In other words, hey, I'm sending you guys along as well. Um, and look, I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. So here's what's interesting. Now, he doesn't really designate in the first one that he went to the marketplace. And we go on in the next verse, it says about noon and then about three o'clock he went out again, he did the same exact thing. So this is three times he goes back to the marketplace looking for people who are standing around. Now, were those people not there, right? Maybe these people had their own things that they had to do. Maybe, maybe some of them were lazy. Maybe some of them, you know, forgot they had to get up maybe they stayed up late and partied or you know maybe they had their maybe they had their own small gardens or whatever that they had to work at whatever but it doesn't he doesn't go in to say but he's you see he's coming at different times throughout the day and and discovering that there's still more people that are in need of labor and uh, and he he does the same thing and then he goes on in verse six then about five he went out and found others standing around, right? Where's he looking? Maybe it's not even the marketplace this time, it's just anywhere. And uh, so we get a, a glimpse of the Father that he's willing to go anywhere to get these laborers. And he says, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? And of course, their response is, because no one hired us, they said to him. And he says, okay, will you go into my vineyard, he told them. 
Now, so again, what do you notice about the Father? What do you notice about Him? We're getting a glimpse through this constant repetition that God is continually searching for laborers. God is continually searching for people to come into His kingdom. This is an ongoing event. This is not something that is stopping. Even today, right now, perhaps, maybe, if this is the first time you're hearing the Word of God, or maybe this is, maybe you've been, God's been leading you and bringing you to this point. Um, maybe, you, maybe you've never even said, maybe I'm not really a religious person, I'm not really a, a person who's into these kinds of things, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm going to listen to some. Um, you see, really what that is, the reason that you're here listening is because God is reaching out to you. He's calling out to you. And that's really why probably at this point you've stuck around this long, because God is searching for you. And um, so that's another aspect that we learn about the character of our God. But then also we notice if another thing about the workers. As, as, you, uh, as you were reading this, as we've been studying this, what do you notice about the other workers? When I mean the other ones, there was the original group that came out in the morning. The others refer to the ones that came subsequently throughout the day, and even particularly at the last hour. And here's, the, here's what we notice. They were not available. They were not there. They were not uh, we learn in the second, in the middle of the second, they were not in the marketplace. For whatever reason that is. And you see, when we're thinking in the terms of the kingdom of God, it's tempting for us to think in terms of the way we view things. And the reality is, is that everyone does not come into God's promise at the same time or in the same manner. We all come through His promise. We all come by faith in Jesus Christ. We all come through the work that Jesus Christ did on a cross. But listen, our, the, the, the way we respond to Him is different for everybody, right? I mean, look at the Apostle Paul, right? He was an avid Jew, and he was ardent about you know, the, the Word of God, and, and so even such that he did not recognize the Messiah until Jesus confronted him on the road to Damascus. To Damascus. And, um, and, uh, and, and so it, it, he, he, in the beginning he was against believers and then later God brings him around. He becomes a believer. Um, everybody comes in at different times. Um, everybody comes into the kingdom in, in, in different ways. Some, okay, I came, through, I came into the kingdom. Some people shared the good news of the gospel with me. I heard it also in church growing up. But... But the big thing was happened that I really came to the understanding was reading a book called The Power of Your Living Through Jesus Christ and coming to that place where I understand that, that I was a sinner, that I was in need of what only God could give me. And that was His salvation and that I just needed to receive that. Um, so everyone doesn't come to God's promises at the same time. And God uses uh, different ways, right? But He's constantly coming out and bringing us into his kingdom. Well then, as we continue to read through the story, we learn now comes the time to pay the wages. So in verse 80 it says, uh, When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, Call the workers and give them their pay. Right? Makes sense. End of the day, time to pay. But he says this in an interesting way. He wants to present this in a specific way. He says, starting with the last and ending with the first. Now, thinking about pay, it's important for us to understand what pay represents in this parable, what Jesus is talking about. You see, pay represents the salvation that God brings. The pay represents... the grace that God has given. The pay represents the reward that God has given us. But it's not a reward, listen to this very carefully, it's not a reward that we earn or that we deserve. It's, a, it's a, what he's trying to say here, there is a reward that he wants to give completely out of his own grace. So that, that payday or that pay time 
really the pay represents the grace, but the pay time at the end of the day represents the coming judgment. It represents what's going to happen in judge, at the judgment time. Look at verse 9. He says, When those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. What? These guys worked for one hour, and they received one denarii, which is the average of one day's pay. So, when the first ones came, they assumed that they would get more, but they received a denarius each. Now, you can understand from a human perspective, you could understand that this really does not seem fair. This really seems a little bit skewed. Why is it that these guys coming in only work for one hour get paid the same as those who were coming and worked at the beginning of the day? Now this is important because we have to understand this. Okay, they, they made an assumption about the king, about the landowner, about the master. They made an assumption about him that what was wrong. They misunderstood his heart. They didn't understand his generosity. They didn't understand what he was trying to do. And so what happened in verse 11, when they received it, they began to complain to the, to the landowner, owner, right? And, and this, this would make sense to any of us, right? These last men put in one hour and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the days and the work, uh, burden of the day's work, and the burning heat. Right? We were the ones out here. We started at the very beginning. We labored out throughout the whole day. We've been pouring out. And, and so thinking about this in terms of, from, from the Jewish perspective, it would have been like, listen, we've carried the the, the, the torch of the Word of God all throughout these centuries. We've, we've transcribed it from generation to generation and we've done all of these things and yet now you're going to go out and, and you're going to give the kingdom freely to, to everybody? It just, you know, why would you even do that? Or maybe even from the disciples' perspective, right? We, you know, they followed and they walked with Jesus and yet who's coming into the kingdom of heaven? You know, prostitutes coming into the kingdom of heaven, uh, uh, people who were demon-possessed and been set free and they're coming into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, people who are poor and blind and broken and they're all coming into the kingdom of heaven and and so Jesus is saying listen so um, uh, these people are saying listen we, we've been doing your work all day um, and uh, and it just doesn't seem fair that we're only getting the same thing that they've got so now we're thinking in terms of the kingdom of heaven you see what God is trying to do and what he's been trying to do is to provide us what we need all the way from the beginning of time and what, he, what we need is good. Even that daily bread, right? He's providing that, that daily sustenance, that daily, everything. It's all good and what, it's what we needed. And, and, uh, and so, um, so he's looking at them in verse 13. He says, uh, which, one of, which one of them? He replied to one of them, friend. And I like how he addresses them as friend, right? Because he's, he's reminding them, you know, that he still cares for them. He said, am I, am I doing you wrong? Right? Am I wrong? Didn't you agree with me on one denarius? In other words, this is what we said in the beginning. So now what? Take what's yours and go. It's that simple. You've been given the gift. And for us, what that means is that is the gift of salvation. That is the gift of God's grace. And really what Jesus is trying to paint for us is, is that all of the workers, whether they came in the morning, whether they came in the middle of the day, whether they came at the last hour of the day, all of them were in just as desperate need as the other. None of them were any different. So he's saying, now take the gift of salvation that I've given you. Just go. Go and do it. He says, and then he expresses, here's an expression of his heart, right? He said, I want to give this last man the same Thing that I gave you. So what is it that God wanted to provide for this last man? He wanted to provide the same gift of forgiveness and salvation to everyone, even those who did not labor in the field all day long. In other words, 
Everyone is in need of salvation. Everyone is in need of God's grace. Everyone is in, is in need of being made holy in order to be brought into that holy relationship with Him. We all have sin, and for all of us, that sin condemns us. That sin keeps us away from God's presence. Again, I'll ask you this question. For how many sins was Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden? Just one. Look, and it doesn't even, it wasn't like they even committed murder. It was they just ate a fruit. But it was a fruit that God said, don't eat it because there's a, if you do, you're going to die. So it was a, there was a, a warning with that. So the whole thing is that what God is saying, he's in, in order to be in a relationship with me, your heart has to be right. And it doesn't matter how much bad and evil and all those things you've done. You, maybe you were out, maybe you, see, you, were, you were out doing whatever and you didn't make it to the marketplace. But you know what the fact is, is that the master was out looking and he came at that last hour of the day and he found you and he brought you into his kingdom. See, there's a, uh, some of you guys may have heard of a guy by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer. He was a, um, a guy uh, back in the 80s uh, that um, uh, committed murder, uh, several murders, and he actually ate the people that he murdered. Very grotesque, a lot of horrible, horrific things, and I won't want to go into to, to the, to details about that. Um, but you could go online and you could you could uh, learn some more about that if you wanted to. Um, but uh, he was eventually caught. Uh, he was building an altar made up of skulls. Um, he was eventually caught, and uh, he was tried and put into prison. Uh, and uh, by his own testimony, he says he came to that place where uh, he was actually confronted. Nobody had ever told him, hey, you're going to be accountable for that time in the end. You're going to be accountable for the things that you've done. As a matter of fact, he wanted to believe, he was believing in what we taught in our public schools, that we're all just evolved from nothing, so therefore we don't really have any explicit purpose, so he felt like he was free to do whatever he wanted. It didn't matter if you kill anybody or not. And, but when he came to faith, Later on, his father also came to faith. He, his father, you know, would come and visit him, and and he would share the gospel with him and give him things to read. And uh, but eventually, I don't know the whole story about how he came to Christ. But eventually, he came to Christ, and he repented, and he said, "I realized for the first time that I was going to be accountable, and that there was a price. There was a price I was going to have to pay." And uh, and so Jeffrey Dahmer, in his last days came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior while he was in prison. And it was, it was shortly after that, it wasn't long after that, um, when he uh, was actually killed by someone else. Someone wanted to be made famous, so they thought they could be made famous by killing this guy, Jeffrey Dahmer. And so uh, God used that probably just to bring Jeffrey to himself and you know, but what? But but looking at this scenario, right? So this is a, one of those situations where here this guy did evil and atrocity all up to that point. But God is saying, you know, you know, the important thing is, is that in that last hour, he came to Christ, and he got what he needed that he could not get on his own. And and it's easy for us to look at someone like this and say, well. I've never done anything like that. My sin is not that evil. So surely I would surely I would get more, I would earn more favor with God and but you see what I'm saying here what Jesus is trying to say is that when we come to God in his kingdom all of our sin keeps us away from him. It doesn't matter how great our sin is or how small we think it is, it's all sin. And it all keeps us away from God's presence. And some people might even say, well, you know what? This was just a, a jailhouse conversion. Listen, I understand that kind of thing happens. People go to jail. They, they, they find Jesus while they're in jail. And, you know, and, and it might be easy for us to judge. I've heard people say about Manuel Noriega. He was, he was the uh, chief down there in Panama during the 70s and 80s, right? And... And uh, he did a lot of evil things, and yet in prison, he also came to Christ. And some, I've heard some people say, well, somebody that evil could never come, could never be converted. And see, 
what we're missing is is that people come at different times and in different ways just like Manuel Noriega, just like Jeffrey, just like uh, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey, Jimmy, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay, God is saying, look, I want to give that same gift of salvation to, to everyone, even if it's in the last hour. Yes, I realize that what these guys did was wrong. They caused hurt. They caused pain. And it's not that they're not going to be accountable for that in any way. Um, but Jesus came and paid the ultimate price. And listen, they're not going, God is not going to, uh, he's going to take care of all those details. We often forget how big of a God he is. And he's able to take care of all that. But the point what Jesus is saying is that his heart is that he wants to bring that gift of salvation. He's looking for that heart that wants to believe. And that wants to know. And we've got to be careful because sometimes we are very quick to judge people by the way they look, by the way they smell, by the way they act. And we may not be able to see or to discern what God is doing in that person. So we do have to be very, very careful about making a judgment call saying, you know, this is a, what a jailhouse conversion, but you know, He's paying his price to society in the case of Jeffrey, in the case of these other guys. Like right? You go to jail and go to prison, you're paying your price to society. But the most important thing is that these guys were set free in their heart before the Lord. So even if they pass away, they're with the Lord. They are in, they have received their wage, the gift of salvation. You see, here's what Jesus, he goes on, he talks about the Father, he says, don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? It's my vineyard. This is my world. These are my laborers. These are my people. Can't, this is my money. Don't I have the right to do with what I want? And we may think, hey, man, it's not fair that, that they would get the same gift of salvation. They would get the same gift of grace. They would get the same gift of love as I get. And I didn't do all those things. And Jesus is saying, this is the heart of the Father. You see, so it comes back to our main point we talked about, right? The Father's gift of grace is undeserved. It's undeserved by all the laborers, by all of us, by every person. And it's equally gracious. No matter what we've done, no matter how bad we've been, it is equally gracious to all of us, and therefore we need not grumble that it is not, uh, uh, not fair. You see? Um, and he says, right in verse, goes on in verse 15, he said, are you jealous because I'm generous, right? And some talks about being, in some translation, talk about being the evil eye. Are you giving the evil eye? What is the evil eye? It's when people would look with hatred and disdain on someone because they've done something wrong and often was symbolized or characterized with casting a curse on that person but it's all seated in that that deep hatred right so are you are you uh, giving the evil eye towards them because you don't like my generosity you not like what I'm doing um, I've always been touched by um, what happened with John the Baptist um, uh, it's so John the Baptist of course he's out proclaiming Jesus he's talking about the coming of Jesus the Messiah and in that he's also developed a group of, of followers people who are adhering and listening to John and and it says that there arose a dispute between John's disciples and a Jew about purification so they came to John and they told him rabbi the one you testified about who's the one he testified about Jesus and who was with you across the Jordan, in other words, you baptize him, he's bap now he's baptizing. He's doing what you were doing. And everyone is going to him. There was like this jealousy that the disciples were having, like, wait a minute, we're losing the limelight here. We're losing our following, we're losing our prestige. But I love John's response. And John helps us to, and John wasn't perfect John struggled we, we've learned that later and we talked about that some in our previous series but 
But John said something that has resonated in my heart for years and years and years and years. Look what he says. He says, no one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. As, as co-laborers, as laborers, as people who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, everything we have is because it's what he has given us. Nothing different. And, uh, and he, he even said, you, you, guys, you guys can testify. I've told you. I've said I'm not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. Guys, you've heard me say that. No surprises here. As a matter of fact, he, he clarifies that by saying the one who has the bride is the groom. In other words, the, the main guy is not, is not the, the bridegroom. The main, the main guy is the, is the groom because he's the one marrying the bride. He says, but the friend, the groom's friend, who stands by and listens to him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So he's saying, now my joy is complete. Why? And then look at his response. I must, he must increase and I must decrease. There's that humility and that brokenness that John has because he understands the bigger picture. He understands what's happening in the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is not about himself, but it's about God making provision for man. He's making provision for us. So we step back, right? And Jesus says it this way. So the last will be first and the first will be last. He said this many times. This is not the only time that he said this. And, and it's important for us to understand what he's talking about is what we perceive to be as valuable. The people that we perceive to be the ones that are high and exalted and the ones that we perceive to be, you know, we might say, oh, look at this great pastor, look at this great deacon, or look at this great, uh, you know, whoever. Um, and we'll tend to say, well, certainly that person must be highly rated in the kingdom of God. And yet we don't know the motives of that person's heart. We don't know their deep, intimate relationship with God and the brokenness that they have before him. And how does that compare with the prostitute that just came broken, or, or like we just read about Jeffrey Dahmer who lived that horrific life, and yet in the end becomes broken and understands his sin and becomes, and he gives an account, right? So, so there is that, when, what Jesus is saying is, is that there, we're gonna be surprised at who's gonna be, have that high standing before God, right? Um, uh, Sean, uh, Douglas Sean O'Donnell in his commentary, he wrote this, he says, the first are those believers, they are, the, uh, they are Christians as well, who due to their status, wealth, power, talent, beauty, success, fame, or any other trait deemed valuable to the world are much esteemed by the world and often also within the church they are first in the eyes of man, but not necessarily in the eyes of God. So one of the reasons so many sinners came flocking to God is because they realized that they were broken. And so much, those of us that have been in the church for so long, we're so caught up in the things that we've done, the good works that we do, that we don't even see our sinfulness. We kind of like to elevate ourselves. Jesus even uh, gave an illustration talking about that, right? Like, you know, don't, don't put yourself first. Take the lowest seat and let God exalt you. Um, and uh, so, so as we're thinking in terms of this, we've learned the heart and the nature of, of our God that He is giving to all of us the one amazing gift that none of us can earn. That all of our sin is equal that all of our sin keeps us away from Him, and that all of our sin was paid for by Jesus Christ. So the reality is this. The reality is that none of us deserve more than the other. We're all in need of God's grace just the same. That this morning, it doesn't matter the extent to which you have sinned. The grace of Jesus Christ the price that he paid. Remember, where did he hang? He hung on a cross, save for the worst and the cruelest of people, and hung by murderers. 
right, and identified with the murderers. And he said, in reality, he says, um, so the reality is, is that we're all in the same need. Listen, the real danger is for those who are in the position of saying, well, I'm a good person. That is a dangerous position to be in. Because then we're starting to measure our own merit. But also, we begin to have a heart like the Master. When we begin to understand His heart, we begin to rejoice that others are coming to Him in the eleventh hour. And that they receive the same promise of get, uh, and the same grace. So when we think about, for example, Jeffrey Dahmer, does your heart rejoice? Wow, he's getting, this, he's getting the same righteousness. When he stands before the God, he's wearing the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the same gift of righteousness that you are receiving, and that I'm receiving. Does that make your heart rejoice? Listen, if you understand the grace of God, if you understand your relationship with him, then you understand why that's a, that was a log in your eye and that was a speck in, in his eye. You see, because it, our log keeps us out of a relationship with God. But when we come to that place where that log has been removed, and we've been forgiven, we realize, you know what, it doesn't matter. He's been forgiven. Yes, there's going to be mourning for all those who have lost their lives for because of that. There's, 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 of course, that side of it. But that is the grace that Jesus is giving. And... Um, and you see, uh, Peter said it this way, right? Peter said uh, in Acts chapter 10, he said, Now I truly understand God doesn't show favoritism, but in, every, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So it doesn't matter. If you fear God and you do what is right, in other words, you trust his gift of salvation, God is going to, um, God is going to uh, accept you. And then finally, when we understand the heart of the Father, we under, we get it, it also gives us a glimpse into the nature of the relationship of the, of the Trinity, the Father, Son. I love this picture because it shows, it's a little bit hard to see probably uh, here, but here's a picture of a dove. Here's a, the Father, and of course, here's the Son. Um, I just love that picture. Um, I wish I could find out where, where that was, and I'd love to go see that carving. Um, but... Um, but there's an intimacy in that relationship. The father desperately loves the son. The son desperately loves the father. The spirit loves the son. The son loves the spirit. I mean, there's this relationship that exists among them. That's a oneness. None exalts themselves above. As a matter of fact, we see God exalting Jesus. We see Jesus exalting the Spirit. We see the Spirit exalting Jesus. It's none, there's, there is no self-absorption. And He's calling us into this kind of relationship where we have to realize that there is, there's not people who are, we're, we're, we're not others who are better than other people. It's just, it's just not that way. And uh, so He's giving us a glimpse into that kingdom, into that reality, into that truth. So we get that, um, that kind of a picture. And then finally, Jesus, remember we talked earlier about the Great Commission. He said, remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. It's a promise that he gave. Why? Because he's in authority. Because, listen, what he's doing, the labor, the work that he's doing now in the vineyard, which is the world, which is he doing right now in your heart, okay, he's going to do it. And there's no authorities, there's no, there's no uh, uh, worldly powers that's going to stop him. And he's going to be with all of us all throughout this day, all throughout the day. He's going to be with us as we continue to labor for him in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful this morning to be able to have this opportunity to share your word. Thank you for what I've learned from this. And I thank you, Father, that I have been changed, that my heart has become a little bit more like my Father. And I pray that for those listening this morning, their hearts too have become a little bit more like your heart. And that, Father, that we begin to understand that what doesn't seem fair to us is really nothing about us. It's really about your economy, your kingdom, and what you're accomplishing in this world. 
Father, and I pray that if there's anybody listening this in this in this moment, that today would be the day of salvation, that today they would say, yes, I know that I fall way short. And I know that if I stand before God, I will feel that accountability. I know that I'm going to have to give, just like Jeffrey Dahmer, I've got to give an account for my sin. But then to look up and to see that, Lord, that you, the Lord Jesus Christ, you came and you obeyed the Father perfectly. You didn't deserve death, but you took it anyway so that you could pay the price for us. That today they would believe. Today they would say, yes, I know that my Jesus died for me. I know that my Jesus went and was buried in the grave for me. And I know that because he had no sin, it could not hold him and that he rose from the dead. And now because of he, his resurrection, because in him is life, I now have life in Jesus Christ. Today would be the day that they find that gift. And Father, for the believer maybe who is caught up in the trap of religion, maybe they've, you know, because it's easy, right? It's easy for all of us to get caught up in the trap and to start putting ourselves in a position of justifying ourselves by other people, that today we would lay that aside and say, no, today I see myself not as anybody greater than anybody else but I'm on the bottom just like everybody in need of God's grace. And that all of our labor is, Father, not in vain, but is for your glory. And that, Father, even if we are out laboring in the heat of the day, we're not going to do it with a heart of jealousy or grumbling, Father, but we're doing it because we love, Father, because we're hoping that those who are missing it, that those who are not in the marketplace right now, those who are don't even know that they're they don't even know that they're missing anything, that even in the last hour, they will come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take a minute to really, really say thank you. Thank you, Walt. Thank you, number one, for staying and listening for this whole time and for your participation, your comments, your questions. Um, and I also want to say a special thank you to those of you that have, have shared in this ministry uh, through giving. Um, and that means a lot, you know, that when we think in terms of the, the gospel mission, when we think in terms of, of what it takes, the gospel is free, um, but, uh, but it does require, uh, it, it's not, it, the gospel is free, but it's costly. And, uh, uh, but your gifts uh, make it possible for us to continue to share God's word. And I'm thankful that you can do that. If you, and if you are blessed, if you've been blessed and you can uh, give, uh, you can either send a check to 211 Green Street, Cumberland, Maryland, 21502. Or for most, most of us, we, we have a, a smartphone nowadays. We can just take our camera app, scan that barcode, and that will take you right to our uh, giving page. And uh, listen, I just want to say thank you. It means a lot that you would take the time to do that and that you would share in that ministry if you've been blessed in any way through the study of God's Word. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Or actually, next week, I won't be here next year. Brother John will be here next week. Um, uh, or, so, uh, but thank you. We'll see you the week after that. God bless.